everybody. Alright, just getting set up to build the 100th Mega Midi. Just wait a little bit to see if anyone shows up. It's gonna be a casual stream, just kind of like when I built the Mega Girl. But uh, I just kind of wanted to show you the behind the scenes of how I make these things. <laughs> All by hand, and uh, here's my pick and place machine. Hello, Razzy. Just waiting a couple minutes to see if anyone shows up. Looks like we got three people so far. Yo, what's poppin'? How the audio levels? Music, good. Microphone, good. Just got started. Hi, I appreciated your ad the video. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Hopefully you'll get a little something out of this, too. I will get started building in, let's say, five minutes or so. He gave me this little thing. It's like a little keychain. They add little bribes in all of their PCB packages, like, please. Please give us a good review. Please say this video is sponsored by JLC PCB. Please. He's squishy. right now. Let's see, can I put this in view somehow? Normally I'll do this on the floor because it takes up a lot of space. Let's see, can we even see the stencil? A little bit. I think that'll do. Normally I do two at a time, but I think I'll just stick to one. Make sure the stream doesn't go over like 50 hours. Like the, uh, <laughs> the Mega Girl stream was like six hours or something. 
The Mega Midi is quite relevant to my interests. Ooh, cool to hear. Then I think you'll enjoy the stream. I am by no means a live streamer, but I figured that it would be kind of cool to show off how I build these things. Every single one is built by hand. I never thought I would build a hundred of them. I'll go over some tips and tricks on how to uh, get good results with uh, SMD soldering and stuff like that, too. My first piece of advice is if you ever see these like tubs of solder, you get a lot for your money, but the problem is uh, they get really dry and crusty on the inside. Like, I can't even open this one. I'm trying to get solder everywhere. Yeah, if you ever do SMD stuff, like, even if you keep this solder in the fridge, like, it gets all dry and crusty, and it's, like, it's really hard to use because the flux is all dried out. So, what I normally do is I get the tube stuff, and I've been using, like, this MG Chemical stuff for a little while now. This stuff is awesome. It smells terrible, but it's amazing. But, um, when it's in the tube, you waste a little bit more because you can't put it back into the container. But since it's always fresh, like, the results are so, so much better. Alright. This is the way that I, uh, I get stencils set up for SMD soldering. Um, if you're ever doing SMD soldering, a stencil is basically required. Uh, you'll see people with the tube, like, <laughs> plopping down bits of solder everywhere. Not only does that take forever, but you're gonna get a lot of shorts, and it's really inaccurate. It's like always spring for the stencil. It's only a couple dollars more. It's always worth it. And then what I do is I'll use, <laughs> I'm using old Mega Blaster PCBs, but I'll use PCBs to kind of hold in the target PCB. Make sure it's all lined up here. And it kind of loosely holds it in place, but the most important part is everything is all at the same level, so it's really easy for the stencil to be even. And then I make sure everything's lined up. You want to be super careful with this part. You want to make sure everything is absolutely lined up. The more lined up it is on the first try, the better the result would be. Razzy can't wait to get his. Did you have a recent order? I think I have a few out right now. USPS is currently killing me with their sorting machine issues. Where is Plunger? Plunger, Plunger. <laughs> Another thing I love to use, these thick blue shop towels. Oh, godly. Very low lint, and uh, they're thick enough to like scoop up grease and flux and really thick solder. Okay, making sure my stencil's aligned still and we're stuck down. I'm going to place a line of solder. I'm trying to see if I can get this more in frame. Uh, that's about as good as we can get. I'm, I'm low on table real estate. You'll get the gist of it. So I'll just put a line on this side. Doesn't have to be too big. Since I'm only doing one, I'll definitely waste a little bit, but it's 100. Why not? Let's go crazy. Try not to make a mess. Yeah, again, normally I'll do this step on the floor because there's a lot more room. squeaky thing and what you want to try and do is you want to you want to wipe it across the entire uh, stencil but your goal is to get it on the first try most of the time you'll have to go back and kind of scrub pieces that you miss but if you can get it on the first try you won't get as much bleed over uh, let's see yeah it looks like I missed this part a little bit and normally I'll just kind of just plap a little bit down and then rub it in. 
If a part of a stencil is already looking really nice and covered, you generally want to avoid going over it again. It just makes things a lot more even. And when you go over things with stencils multiple times, the, how can I say this? Like the pile of solder on that particular pad starts to like mush over to other pads and that usually leads to shorts. The closer you can get it on the first try and like you'll have way less shorts when you go to uh, reflow, which saves a ton of time. And then I'll just scoop up all the rest. Looks like I missed a little there. Double check. Missed a little there. It's hard to see because this angle is weird. Missed a little there. There we go. Now, another thing that you want to do when you're doing SMD soldering is once you have your solder paste set in the stencil, the quicker and even more evenly that you can get the stencil off in one fell swoop, the better. So I'll just go whack like that. And let's see. That's looking all right. I'll show you close up. I got a little USB microscope here. Normally I'll use a, uh, a binocular microscope, but let's see if this little USB microscope can show what I'm talking about. Capture device. There we go. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Can we focus? Yeah. The main one here is like the the P, uh, the uh, the microcontroller. See how those pads are like perfectly separated out? That's what you're looking for. That makes it so much easier in the future. Let's see. Do I have any mushy looking pads? Actually, no, not really. It all kind of came out good. Look over here. Those are a little bit mushy, but again, they're, they're separated enough to the point where they'll be easy still. So that was actually a pretty good result. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and clean the stencil. That's another thing that's really important. Always make sure to clean your stencil after you're done or else the solder will dry into it and make the stencil basically unusable. So what I'll normally do is I'll use isopropyl alcohol, which has become extremely rare because every Karen thinks that they can make hand sanitizer themselves, even though hand sanitizer is really common nowadays. Maybe that song doesn't sound correct. I have the Mega Blaster playing on my line in right now. I would use the uh, Mega Girl player that I built last stream, but it doesn't have a shuffle function yet. We need the shuffle. Natalie wants to do like the proper like Apple style shuffle, which is admirable, but I just want random songs. Make sure you get your squeegee too. Cleaning stream, exciting. So, when you're cleaning the stencil, make sure you get both sides, because the solder paste will kind of siphon itself over to the other side and get stuck. And then you want to make sure that all of the stencil pads are all clear. And they're looking good. Okay, stencil part done. <laughs> now we get to the best bit. Pick in place with tweezers. So the way I normally do pick in place is I will literally just have a big ass box of parts and then I'll take a handful of them, nothing too specific. Usually I'll actually start with the microcontroller and the boost converter because they're the trickiest parts, but other than that I'll just take random parts at a time, place them down, and then I shall toss them on the floor. There would be a big pile of parts, but uh, that's how I kind of go through them one by one. Let's get the uh, microcontrollers out. Shuffle is important. Yeah, I agree. Shuffle is important. 
this is an 18 mega, I'm sorry, 1890 USB 128.6. Uh, some versions of this will use the 27. I'm sorry, the 1287. Uh, they're basically the exact same chip. Whatever it's cheapest, I'll usually go for. Let's see. Now, these are 8-bit micros, and I use them because they have native USB support. So they're really, really nice, and they're the same ones that the uh, old 8-bit teensies use, so you get to use all the same libraries. The problem is, these are like 8 or $9 chips, so buying them in bulk is painful. Normally, I'll, I'll get these ones from like Arrow. Like Arrow normally has good deals, but um, they've been kind of rolling back on their. Uh, they used to have like uh, free overnight shipping for like anything, and it was awesome. But now it's like you got you got to spend a hundred dollars before you can do that. Like <laughs> okay, okay. Where did my tweezers go? I had a big pile of tools here. There they are. <clears throat> yep, so normally I'll build these two at a time. I'll build a YM3438 version and a 2612 version at the same time. If you've ever bought one of these and you've noticed a little blue dot right here, that means you have a 3438. That's how I keep track of them while I'm building. <clears throat> and hello new viewers, hello. Gather round, children. We're making boards. All right. So, to place this chip, which is probably the most Wonka S chip, because if you mess it up, you'll get a whole bunch of shorts and they're a pain to fix later. Uh, I'll grab it in the corners like this with tweezers, and then I will try and line up the pins on the very bottom corners. If you make sure those are lined up as well as possible, then you check all the other ones to see if they're lined up, and then you can place down. The better you can get your lineup on this big package, the way, 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 way easier to fix in the future. Uh, normally, I won't even get any shorts if I get it just right. So just for this, I'm not gonna show the action. I'm gonna try and line it up, and then I'll show you the results after. Up. Definitely want to take your time. Top lined up, bottom lined up. Looking good, and then press down, lift up. Try not to move it too much. I moved it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, normally I don't have a whole tripod set up on my camera, so probably not going to get perfection this time. Just tapping it to make sure it's lined up. Yeah, looking good. All right. switch to a little microscope cam. Yep, see that's kind of what we're looking for. The paste isn't absolutely perfect, but the surface tension will flow it onto the pads. Basically, I'm just trying to line up the, uh, let's see, where is the microscope looking at? I'm trying to line up the pad with the foot of the package. I'll just kind of ignore the solder paste. As long as the pad is lined up with the foot, it'll be good. There we go. Get rid of this. Do you use reading glasses or do you have good eyesight? I have 20-20 vision. Like, I, I actually went to an eye doctor, I think, like six months ago, and yeah, I actually have 2020. Hello, Geo. How are the audio levels? Voice good, music good? Whoa. 
Yes, alright. We in business. Music is a bit quiet, mic is good. Oh no! <laughs> alright, how about we meet in the middle ground with the music? There we go. This little chip is also a pain because it's so tiny. A little itty bitty boost converter. You can barely even see that on the stream. Yeah, I use this little tiny itty bitty boost converter to boost USB voltage, which is normally 5 volts up to about 6 volts, and then I'll use a linear regulator to make it go back down to 5 volts. And that actually does cut down a significant amount of the USB noise, but uh... It doesn't cut down all of it, like if you have a particularly noisy system with like a ton of spinning hard drives and a ton of fans, honestly there's not much you can do about it. Uh, but this does cut out almost all of it if you have a somewhat decent power supply from USB. <laughs> My computer in particular is actually really freaking noisy because I have two spinning discs and a ton of fans. But uh, I found out that I have a little USB uh, PCI Express card, and that actually has fairly good power. Uh, just making sure it's lined up. Usually my five head will not be in the way while I do this. It's tiny parts. But yeah, um, those little USB PCI ex uh, Express cards, great power coming out of it, super clean. And then I'll use something like my MacBook, which uh, is all solid state and has really low key fans. Basically, zero noise. It's pretty awesome. Okay, just follow my template here. I can probably do this all by memory, but I'll use just uh, OBS display capture. This visual bomb thing where it shows me like where everything is, oh, super nice. Oh, what is this doing? That's way out of space. There we go. Yeah, this visual bomb thing is amazing. Just to keep track of stuff, I love it. Okay, 51K resistor. Let's go to the boost converter. All it takes is good eyesight and a steady hand. All right, two resistors. I'm trying to find a good balance between me actually seeing it in real life and then actually having the camera. Can I zoom in a little bit? I'll start losing resolution, but there we go. That's a little better. Is it significantly cheaper to build them by hand? So, I don't know about significantly cheaper. Um, I think JLC PCB has an assembly service. Um, the problem is I use quite a few specialty parts, so you have to find a way to send them over to JLC, and that seems kind of like a big pain in the butt. And also, I don't really sell that many of these. I know this is like the 100th one, but the volume is low enough that I can keep up by hand. So. I don't know. I've never really had an issue building them by hand. I think if I was selling like, <laughs> I don't know, like 10 a week, which is way higher than what I do. I only sell a couple of these a month. Uh, then I would definitely do PCBA. <laughs> We're probably definitely gonna have to fix shorts later because it's, it's fairly difficult to keep this in frame and place the parts. Normally I'll have it right under my nose. That was the level translator for the USB, or not the USB, the um, micro SD. This chip is five volts, SD cards are three volts. Mm. 
Linear regulator. Ooh, fancy ST ones. None of that Chinese garbage. Although you will see Chinese garbage later because they're the same thing, but way cheaper. This is premium ST 5 volt regulator. Only the best for you guys. Oh, tripod leg in the way. Go. Actually, I think this camera goes up to 4K. Did it freeze it? No. Yeah, I'm not gonna mess with it. Okay. 22 ohm resistors. That is for USB connections. I hate when packages split like that. Oh, there we go. The two USB resistors are right here. Is there a way I can move this up just a little bit? Be cool. Nicer if it was near me. Let's see. There we go. What's the main microcontroller? It is an Atmel 90 USB 1286. It's basically the same one that's on the Teensy boards. Whoa. I'm trying to get this a little more near to me. That's, that's more like it. Oh, that's way better. Cool. Yeah, that microcontroller is super handy dandy, but they expensive AF. God, they're like $9 parts. I thought the Teensy was a 32U4. Yes, um, there's a couple 8-bit versions of the Teensy. Um, one of them uses the USB 128. What the hell is it? One, two, eight, six. Uh, the other one d uses the 32U4. Mm, 10K resistors. One is a pull up for the reset, the other two serve as a voltage divider for the op amp bias. Here is the pull-up resistor for reset. <laughs> this song came up again. It is very broken for some reason. <laughs> I wonder what's happening with it. These two 10Ks form a 50% voltage divider, which will be the bias for the op amp. Oh, I found a little translator chip that fell down. Okay, more parts. Ah, one thing I wish I could do is reduce the of this a little bit, but every part's needed. Okay, these are the signal diodes for the opto isolator on the old school MIDI input. Okay, the song broke AF. 
<laughs> Doggy, please don't bark. There we go. Make sure to double check the impossible to see line on the diode. And match with silk screen. Ta da! Uh, 220 ohm resistors, that's normally for the <clears throat> LCD backlight and for the LEDs down here. Make sure I'm marking off my stuff here. What did I just place? Yeah. Cool. LCD backlight. I'm having a lot of fun with the Mighty Core for the 1284. Ton of flash RAM. Yeah, I love that chip. It is chonky. I used to use it a lot. In fact, I still have the uh, data sheet <sighs> on my wall here. Uh, this boy. Yeah. Love that chip. Big ass dip chip. Pretty cheap for what you get. Yeah, it's actually one of the more reasonable priced ones. All of the USB 8 bit Atmels are ridiculously overpriced, in my opinion. Like, um, for my new prototype with the uh, YM2151, I don't know if you've seen any of those uh, progress videos. Uh, I've actually swapped over to prototyping with one of the Adafruit feather boards that have the uh, Atmo version of the ARM Cortex M0. First off, pretty damn easy compared to the STEM32 boards I normally use. And uh, yeah, honestly, you get an ARM microcontroller that is way, way faster, with way easier USB, and way less uh, like support parts needed. I don't see myself going back to eat the Atmel after this, to be honest. Because these chips are like, like eight or nine bucks. And it is painful when you're only buying ten. And with tax, it's like a hundred dollars. I'm like, ugh. <laughs> That's another piece of advice I could give myself if I ever had to like completely restart is keep track of the stock that you have, like when it comes to components. When you first get your first batch of components, track them all, and anytime you need to use them, like you're building a board, subtract the amount that you have, because keeping track of stock after you've used components is basically impossible, because now you have to manually count everything. And when you have like a high bomb count um, part like this, it, it's just impractical to recount them all. One of these is for the LED inside the optic isolator, and one is for the LED on the backlight. It is in JLC's part library for assembly. Yes, it is. Are you talking about the... Um 1284 or this USB chip here because I, I haven't seen this USB chip in JLC at all. You have bins of partial cut reels lying everywhere. It's for 30 minutes for the parts you're trying to find. Yeah, I'll keep like special drawers of parts specifically for different projects like the uh, OPL3 thing. And uh, yeah, I, I won't mix parts so I'll just take out uh, take stuff out of the bin, use the part, and then I'll just throw on the floor so I can keep track of what I've already done. And then once I'm done, I'll throw everything back into the bin. Okay, this is the big fat power diode for the DC to DC. Chunky boy.
<laughs> it's the easiest way to keep track of what you already use, just chuck it on the floor. materials here. I know where everything is by heart, but I'll always like check things off just to make sure that I have everything placed. These are the PSG mix resistors. Uh, normally I'll have the PSG actually pretty freaking loud on the Mega MIDI because it's more of an instrument. I'll have it mixed down a lot lower on things that are like music players. But I figure people would probably like to hear the PSG a little bit more if they choose to use it. Man, that's another thing. I see a whole bunch of these like YM2612 MIDI synths coming out. And uh, they're nice, but they never have the PSG. Like I know everyone's into like the, the FM synth and that's cool and all, but like you're, you're missing half of the synthesizer. <laughs> We're gonna do the crystals later because there are some tiny parts in this area and this is a tall boy. DLC assembly is cheap enough that it's totally worth it, even for passes and stuff. Yeah, I was considering doing it to be honest. Um, like I said, my volume is low enough that it's just kinda, it's just something that kinda keeps me busy. It's really, ugh, it's not that bad. Um, <laughs> honestly, the SMD part is the easy part. I hate soldering like like these push buttons. Oh my god, it's so tedious because I have to do it by hand. The hand part, like for the through hole soldering, that sucks. Yeah, everyone's always like, uh, oh man, I'm so scared of uh, SMD work. It's so scary, so many shorts. Like honestly, SMD work is really, really easy and fast compared to through hole components. is just as important. Right, it is. So many songs on the Genesis use the PSG to add so much depth to their music. I love hearing songs to create a PSG usage. That and the noise channel is kick-ass for a hi-hat. If your track doesn't have a good hi-hat, don't even add me. Programming resistors for the DC to DC. Only one. You should check out YM2020. It's another Genesis compilation album cartridge. I will definitely check that out. Hell yeah. I failed enough with SMD soldering that I'm scared of soldering anything expensive. I I can I can see that's valid. Yeah, sometimes um sometimes SMD soldering is a pain in the ass when you just cannot get a bridge to go away. And then you ruin the part, you're like, uh, are you lift a trace? Ugh. Uh, it is very unlikely that I'll get a perfect reflow on this part, so you'll likely see me trying to fix shorts, and I'll show you how I do it. It's actually not that bad. This is... 2.2k resistors. Um, two of them are for the YM2612 pull down on the output lines, and then one of them is actually required for the PSG's um, ready signal. But I actually never ever even consider the PSG ready signal. I completely ignore it because the timing is the same every single time. 
Uh, I figured I would do it correctly though, just in case like anyone wants to like hack the hardware or has any use for it, so I'm like, might as well just put it there, it's one extra resistor. Yeah, this board is definitely designed with kind of hacky people in mind, want to modify it themselves. Hot air gun in an oven make it okay, yes. Decent flux, yes. Resistor stand up and tombstone. I've actually never had that happen once. I've never had a tombstone resistor. I've seen them like kind of shift over to the side, but never tombstone. Let's go to tiny cam, see what we're doing. Check in. So far, we're almost done with the DC to DC. Got the programming resistors and a cap. Got our fancy ST linear regulators. The level shifter for the SD card. Our micro, sitting pretty. We got some resistors over here. The 10Ks on the right are the voltage divider for the uh, op amp bias, and those are the pull downs for the YM's output. And then we got some mixing resistors for the PSG. <laughs> we haven't even done the LEDs yet, which are the biggest pain in the ass. I would get SMD uh, PCBA just for the LEDs. Ugh, that's that's probably the one thing I hate. It's just putting the. Uh, SMD LEDs on. Ooh, this track is good for showing off the PSG. will get dried out and not have flux so it basically stops working. Yes, absolutely. That is why I use tubed flux instead of the big bins of it. You waste a lot more but it is totally worth it for the fresh flux. It makes a humongous difference. <laughs> the polarity indicator. Honestly, I can see the polarity indicator just fine. It's just, um, I've, I've done it multiple times, even though I've built literally a hundred of these things. Um, the, uh, the solder paste will cover up the really subtle marking I have on the silk screen to show me which way the LED is supposed to go, and I'll always put them back and I'm like, ugh, to get the hot air gun and to completely redo them. things, I think. Yes, there is. And they herber. I have done that a couple times, the, um, like, refluxing the paste. It kind of works, but it's nothing like brand new paste out of the jar, because uh, you'll still get like lumpy, like chunks of dried solder. I don't know, it's just never, it, it, it works like a little bit, but it's never been that good for me. Alright, I'm just placing all of the decoupling capacitors under nanofarad. This one is a debounce capacitor. <laughs> this cap right here, I don't really know what I was thinking. I was trying to isolate digital and analog supplies. It is the um, decoupling cap for the PSG, but it's way far away. I've never had issues with it. It's been fine, but it, it does seem weird that it's really far away. It's on a thick trace, so it probably doesn't make that much of a difference, but eh.
Another interesting use for these 100 nanofarad caps is I'll actually put one in series with the clock line of the YM2612. And um, normally the YM2612 will run fairly hot, but putting 100 nanofarads on the clock in series actually significantly cools it down. It always seems to break other chips, but on the YM2612 it works really good. I heard it off some form somewhere, I could never recite where I found it, but like ever since I learned that, I've been doing that trick ever since. SMT assembly is much more fun when I'm not doing it, yeah. I don't know, it's somewhat therapeutic, placing parts down. Or that might be Stockholm Syndrome, I don't know. I don't know why it works. You'd think it would mess up the clock. It messes up the clock and like every other chip I've tried it on, but the YM2612 seems to love it. It'll still get warm, but it's way less like absolutely burny as it normally is. I'm gonna mod my Genesis real quick. Yeah. Filter resistor. Yeah, this is kind of something I've adopted, like this kind of hand stance where I'll hold the part and then stabilize it with my other hand. I can actually get a really, really steady hand. It doesn't help when my tweezers get sticky, though. Hold on, let me clean these real quick. Alright, let's try that again. Always important to remember to breathe. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. I'll, I'll do the thing where it's like Sniper in Call of Duty where you like hold your breath. Oh, hello, Latch. How's it going? We building today. All right, 6.2. Two of those. These are the mixers. YM2612. The magnetized ones are the worst. Uh, yeah. Tell me about it. I really want to get a nice pair of the uh, the Japanese brand Engineer, like Engineer tweezers. Uh, these ones seem to work fine. I love the curve style, but um, the metal is really, really soft. So if you bend the tip of them, like let's see if I can actually put it in the microscope. This is good. If you bend the tip of these uh, tweezers, it makes it really hard to pick up SMD stuff. Like see how they're not totally flush with each other right at the very tip? Uh, once that gets really, really far apart, it's super hard to pick things up. And that's when you kind of have to trash them. Uh, what are these? 
was 2.2. I thought we just placed those. Yes. Okay, what do we got now? 22 Pico Fair. These are for the main crystal oscillator. Be careful, SpongeBob. Be careful, SpongeBob. Be careful, SpongeBob. Six oh threes, baby. Tiny boys. Go. Uh, op amps. So in the specification, I actually called for a TL072 op amp, and those work fine. But actually, uh, I've been using. Uh, LM833s and they work better at 5 volts and they sound pretty dang good. The cool thing about op amps is they almost all have the same pinout so it doesn't really matter which one you use you can just swap them out interchangeably. These ones are definitely more expensive than TL uh, 074s <clears throat> but I think they're worth it. Skyrim tonight. Uh, sure, I'm down. Probably be exhausted after this. Let's see, 1k resistors next. This is for the Octo Isolator. Uh, the actual MIDI specification calls for a 220 ohm and a 270 ohm resistor for the Octo Isolator. I've always wondered if I could just use two 220 ohm resistors instead of having to worry about the single 270 to like cut down the bomb cost. Like that's with the margin of error, right? It should work, but uh, since I've already had these, I'm just like, fine, I'll follow the spec. Nah, I should be down for tonight. I just want to finish this first. Uh, 10 microfarad. Uh, not microfarad. Yeah, microfarad. <laughs> the U1. There's a lot of these. So, I use X7R for the 10 microfarads because of the DC DC. If you don't, you'll get ringing. The problem is, these expensive. <laughs> Only the best. probably use X5R, which are usually pretty dang cheap, but, uh, I don't know. Once, once you get a part and you like it, it's just easier to restock it whenever you need it. What Opto are you using? Uh, what is the name of it? Uh, H11L1. more upbeat song. Come on, Mega Blaster, give me something good. <laughs> I guess that'll work. I'm going on an adventure.
doesn't exactly show off the technical prowess of the chip, but I guess I'll get the job done. Stopping by, David. Fun fact, David actually bought the very first one of these things way back in the day. <laughs> the design has very much improved, by the way. Those OG ones had a couple issues. Mainly me using some weird auto <laughs> Russian auto router. That was a bad idea. Always manually route your boards. Is the PSG stereo? Um, it is not stereo, it's mono, however, I mixed it into the stereo channels. Okay. Hello, Mini Error. Oh, actually, um, I believe I called the USPS on your order, I think, and, um, they, that was a pain in the butt, but um, they said it was bound for Idaho, but it got stuck in Texas for some reason, but um, I just checked on it this morning, and it looked like uh, they finally got it fixed, and it's going to Chicago International, which is usually a sign of it actually going abroad. But uh, I, had a, I had another um, customer that ordered one who is in the UK, and they sent it to Canada, and it did like the uh, like the import status, uh, like the customs looked at it, so they think it's actually gonna terminate in Canada. But it's just like, what, what, what? I never had a problem shipping to Europe and the UK until uh, they started messing with the US uh, stupid sorting machine. Gotta love the U.S. political climate. Yeah, thankfully, I think yours, Mini Air, I think yours is gonna make it just fine. Uh, once it hits the uh, the international hub, which it should have done a lot sooner, usually it's fine. <laughs> Although, don't be surprised if it ends up in Idaho for some reason. If it does that, then I'll just give you a refund or send out another one. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you stopped by, because it's, it's nice to talk to you directly and be like, Dude, I promise I didn't do this, I'm not trying to rip you off. <laughs> I had um, an order like a year ago where the uh, the courier was told to pick it up from my doorstep and uh, when they, they scanned it in to be like, okay, we got the package, they actually scanned it as delivered so it just showed like it was delivered at my doorstep <laughs> as the first tracking information and the dude that bought it is like, bro, what the heck, you're trying to rip me off? I'm like, no, 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 it was misscanned, I promise you'll get it. <laughs> 
And they open up like a whole PayPal like dispute and stuff like that, and they're like, no, please! I, I really would use like UPS or FedEx or DHL or whatever, but it literally costs for like small people. It costs the same amount as the actual PCB to do international shipping. It's like $140 minimum. It's ridiculous. You have to be like a high volume shipper to actually get anything remotely reasonable. So honestly, the only thing I have, and honestly, the only thing that like all small businesses have in the United States is the USPS. about six months after being sent. Yeah. yeah there's, there's no end of weird postal service nonsense that happens. I had a customer in Chile uh, right before COVID struck. So honestly, it's not exactly the USPS's fault, but uh, I sent them one of my uh, OPL3 players and uh, it got stuck. Like, like COVID hit right when I shipped it. So it got stuck for months and months and months and months and months and months. And all of a sudden just one day it showed up. But uh, yeah, even if you have priority mail, good luck trying to get an insurance claim from the USPS. I've had an order sitting since March for a refund. Like I have the package back, I got everything back, but it said return to sender, apply for a refund. Yeah, it's literally been stuck in limbo for months. At this point, I've just kind of given up on it. Like, oops, lost 40 bucks on shipping. It looks like it's been a round the world adventure. <laughs> it kind of feels like it. One second. Your, uh, your shipment to uh, to uh, Paris, it reminded me of this. <laughs> it's just stuck in Texas. what I'm going to the restroom real quick I will be right back I almost pulled everything on my desk there we go
All right, we back. So hype to get mine and make some sweet FM melodies. PSS 479 and 2. Ooh. Ooh, fancy. Yeah, it really is. It's a fun little tool. I'm, I'm glad I made it, to be honest. I, um... I'm working on a 2151 synth right now, and, um... A lot of the MIDI code I'm, I'm just porting over from here, but uh, I found so many tiny errors in this board. Like nothing that's going to cause like any issues to the end user, but anyone that reads the code is going to be like, uh, what? Like in the MIDI spec there's like NRPN or something like that, and I'd called it NRPM, as in like rotations per minute. And it's like that throughout the entire script, and like, uh, I'm going to need to go back and fix that. LEDs, I forgot we haven't done those yet. Always fun. Uh, here is the optical isolator. I haven't actually used these yet. Any specific reason for the 2151 project? Um, I've always liked that chip. Uh, it's definitely really similar to the YM2612, but um, it was used in arcade stuff a lot. It's got a lot of really good soundtracks on it, but um, I always wanted to do like a music player and a MIDI synth at the same time. Like um, this could probably do VGM playback for the FM and the PSG, but it will definitely struggle on the PCM for the YM2612, so that's why I haven't done it. Uh, but with this new project, I'm using an ARM Cortex chip, which is more than fast enough to handle FM. Um, as for the MIDI side, it has two more channels than the YM2612, and since it's using an external DAC, it sounds way, way better. Which I guess is subjective. Like, objectively speaking, the resolution is higher, so it does sound better. Um, some people like the YM2612's grittiness, which is its appeal, but uh, if you're just talking about resolution of sound, the 2151 is objectively better. Are you going to add PCM support to the 2151? Okay, so I thought about that. Um, I would love it. I would absolutely love it. Like, just to put a DAC on there, it'd be great. The problem is uh, the 2151 didn't use a single PCM chip. It used, like a whole bunch of different proprietary ones, so I'd need to emulate all of those, and I don't think it's practical on a Cortex M0. Uh, one technique that I thought is like pre-rendering the PCM on the uh, on a PC and then sending it over USB, but even that has like pretty ridiculous memory requirements, so I think, sadly, I'm gonna skip out on PCM for the 2151, which sucks, but it's just like a matter of practicality. Have you ever played with Plogue stuff? Um, I actually have not. I'm subscribed to his channel. He makes amazing work. Plogue, if you're watching, want to shoot a license my way, you know. Just, just help out a friend in the space. Have you guys seen his uh, new SNES uh, breakdown video of how he made a... Uh, one of his uh, software synths that emulates the uh, SHVC from the NES. It's amazing. I have a couple of those SHVCs and uh, I made the same kind of music player that he made, just modified it for an Arduino and stuff like that. And uh, it, it definitely is cool to hear the SNES from like, the, it's like directly from the unit. SNES, uh, SNES music anyway, but um, the way that chip works, honestly I don't know how he figured out how to make it into a MIDI synth, because it is complicated AF, proprietary protocols, and everything. It does not work like the FM synthesizers. <laughs> I 
kinda, I wish I was more of a musician too. Like, uh, I'm a technical guy, so I, I understand, like, the theory behind music and synthesizers and how they work and all that stuff, but, uh, when it comes to actual talent, ooh, lack in that department. I can play simple stuff, like, enough to program my synths, but I've never really seen anyone show me, like, what they've made with the Mega Mini. I would love to see more of that. A couple people have sent me their projects in the meet, but uh, I want to see what people make. That's why I build these. Just like the pursuit of enabling artists to make their stuff, that's that's why I build these. Okay, LEDs are done, that wasn't so bad. Let's see, which okay, we got what are we missing here? I think we're almost done. Uh, the crystal needs to go on, SMD caps, we're missing caps right here too, okay. If I make something with a Mega Mini, I'll let you know. Oh, please do. I can't wait to see what people make. One technique that I find is cool is people, uh, We'll route it through like effects processors like delay pedals and reverb pedals and stuff like that. It makes it sound so cool. I wish uh, the biggest feature I wish I could make for this, and it, it's programmed, it's pretty much ready to go, is uh, multi temporality. Right now it's it's mono timbral, which means you can only have one patch for all of the channels. But obviously, in like uh, real Sega Genesis songs, they'll they'll swap the patches on the channels to make you know different instruments playing at the same time. Uh, the reason why I don't have that on here is the Windows MIDI driver will only let you use one channel per device per connection on Macintosh, and I'm pretty sure Linux too. You don't have to worry about that. But ah, freaking Windows MIDI driver is ancient. So I made the decision, rather than having edge cases for a large majority of users, I was just like, I'll just keep it simple and keep it mono, but man, I, I wish I had poly so badly. One hard thing to do when you're designing stuff like this is, FM synthesis is hard. It is ridiculously complicated. So to make it as easy as possible for your end user is paramount, or else they're gonna look at this box and be like, what the hell do I do with this thing? That's why I made Mega MIDI Control. Uh, originally, you can only load pre-made patches, which is handy because you get instant music right out of the gate, but uh, some people do like that kind of hardware hacking, like getting into the FM. But uh, you have to strike a balance between power to do things with your product and users actually understanding how your product works and not scaring them off. So it's kind of a judgment call. The more steps that your end user has to do to make your product work, the more likely it is that they'll just, you know, ignore and just not use your product correctly. Or they'll just get straight up bored with it, fed up, not use it. Ease of use and open source hackability is the name of the game for this guy here. <laughs> Normally I'm a little faster than this, so my flux paste is starting to dry out. Hopefully we get good reflow. Just double checking everything here. Uh, 270 is placed, I think, right? Yep, we just did that. Two is good. Okay, big caps. It is difficult to get in their headspace, and uh, your job as a designer is just to kind of... You have to think like an end user would think. Obviously, you know, getting some focus testing from friends and stuff like that is helpful, but... At the end of the day, you have to make the judgment call on what you think is simplest. And uh, <laughs> that's why designers are paid the big bucks. Just kind of understanding how normal people think and how they're going to perceive your product. A 
the hell, even I'm still learning, like, I'm by no means a master. I'm not even an electrical engineer for real, like, all this is just self-taught. So I'm, I'm learning stuff every day when it comes to, like, selling things online, too. That's a whole other can of worms. But I think it's been a really good experience. Like, I've learned so much about, like, electronics engineering, these old chips, making a project for, uh, like, that other people can enjoy to kind of, like, save the history of these ancient chips. I don't know, it's, it's really cool. That's why I keep doing it anyway. Okay. He'll do my promo. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I've been looking for someone that can actually, like, legit play an instrument just to, like, show off what my thing can do. Because I can only show so much. Okay, I think we're pretty much ready for reflow here. Just double checking to make sure I have all the parts set. Yeah, we're looking good. Okay, I'm gonna go throw this in the oven, and then, hey, maybe we can look at the uh, new player that I'm building right now. So while we wait for that to cook, I'll show you my new breadboard prototype for the 2151. <laughs> Thanks, Mitty. <laughs> Once you move to Idaho. <laughs> yeah. Idaho or Texas? Um... Yeah, so this is actually pretty cool because it can play VGM and MIDI. It is definitely still in the early stages. Let me get the uh, line in here. But uh, yeah, it, it seems to be working. Snaking this line and cable around. Fair warning, the USB noise, like there's no filtering yet, so it might be really ugh. Uh, let me put it to... VGM player mode real quick. The VGM player is definitely in its early stages because it is very crashy, but it gets the job done. Oh, that's not plugged in. Eh. There we go. Yeah, we, we don't do those clean Ben Eater prototypes in this house. It is Spuget Nation. Which normally actually works fine. It's just the these DuPont cables, I'm getting sick of them because some of them are like broken on the inside. So you'll make the prototype perfectly, right? But you have one cable that's broken on the inside. So you have to go and do a continuity check on everyone and like, ugh, it's awful. So right now it's in VGM player mode. Is doing his business. But uh, you can actually swap it and throw it into ugh, MIDI mode. Uh, I don't have enough USB cables on this desk right now. I'm trying to hook up my little MIDI controller here, but I don't know if I have enough cables to do that. I put them all away. Eh, we can just play with one channel. So if I ground this pin here and reset it, now it's in MIDI mode. 
and I've just been using my little Mega MIDI control thing that I built for the um, well, the Mega MIDI uh, to send it uh, voice data. Let me uh, up the device. That's not showing up for some reason. Let me uh, refresh it real quick. CTRLR not working correctly? Color me surprised. Oop. Hmm, for whatever reason, it's not recognizing the Adafruit board. Probably because it's on stream, so it makes me look silly. I swear this never happens. Let's try a different USB port. Uh, uh, I've had issues with those ports lately. There we go. There's those USB ports. Yeah, the top USB ports on my motherboard got shorted out or something. Like, they can't supply enough current. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so now it opened. Supremely annoying. So that's the 2151 in mini mode. Change the algo. Oh wait, no, I disabled that part. But we can change the patch. It looks like a feather blue fruit. Yes, it is. Um, I'm not using the, the uh, Bluetooth module at all, and I don't think I'm going to. Uh, I just had that board handy because it had the microcontroller I wanted. So yeah. So it is a, uh, it's a MIDI synth and a VGM player. How fun is that? <laughs> I would hook up my uh, MIDI controller to test it out, but I only have the single USB cable right now. Brassy and classy. <laughs> I literally had a billion cables all spread out like, like I have a whole stack of them, like just falling off my desk for testing. But I clean them all up to uh, make the stream look pretty, and now I need one. Moral of the story, kids, never clean up. board is almost done, it just needs to cool down a little bit. You'll probably hear a beep soon. Room smelling like cancer because of the flux. Always fun. Wait a minute. <laughs> Does it have a name yet? Does it have a working title? No! I'm trying to think of something catchy. Oh, beep. Like, um, my first 2151 music player is like Arcade Classic. It sounds really cool, but I'm like, man, I wish I could use that name again. Maybe Arcade Classic 2. Electric Boogaloo. I still get people asking about that Arcade Classic board. That is one of the first PCB, it is the first PCB I ever designed. So it is hot garbage, auto-routed. <laughs> uh, it, it gets the job done, but oh my god, every time I look at that board, I'm like, there's so many mistakes. Let's see, refresh. I'm going to rewatch CTRLR. Wow, it is just a USB struggle fest right now. Where is this boy connected? Eh. Vines of Kink. Is 
this connected to. That was my USB reader. And my MIDI controller doesn't want to connect. We will figure that out later. I think it's just a uh, bum USB port. Uh, but whatever. My USB ports are currently occupied by 8 billion cameras. Throw some features and specs out we can brainstorm. Uh, it's got a YM2151 synth. And um, that, that that's pretty much it. Gonna get some water real quick. Okay, board is ready, so let me clean this up real quick. We'll play with this a little bit later. New board, fresh out the oven. Let's get the music playing again. Oh man, I had a prototype a while ago <clears throat> where I was doing like a, um, it was an OPLL board, but it was in the style of a stylophone where you could play it like a MIDI controller, but it had like a capacitive stylophone kind of thing going on. I never got around to that project because I couldn't find a capacitive chip that I liked the best. And uh, the style of uh, the stylus always ate away at my uh, my little metal plates, but that was a cool project that had a really neat logo on it. I wonder if I can find it again. Give me just a second to indulge me. Gosh, I can't even remember what I called that thing. Like OPLL stylo or something like that. There it is. Schematic stylo project. Here. This is a project that never saw the light of day. My OPLL stylophone. Someday I'll go back and finish this. Check out that logo. <laughs> I actually have a prototype board built somewhere and it looks really, really cool. And it does actually kind of work. It's just the logistics part of it. Like, uh, the logistics of, um, not getting these keys to rub off with the stylophone part, and, uh, I was having issues with the microcontroller. Something is not routed correctly right here, and I never did figure it out. And, uh, I was building this right when we were doing a move, like, we are moving houses, so it, this just kind of got lost in the wind. 
Anyway. Back to the board at hand. It is manual soldering iron time. Have you seen the Lestrum? No, I have not. Okay, um, so normally when I get a board right out of the oven, I'll visually inspect it just to see if I can see any shorts. And I'm looking at the main microcontroller, I don't see any with my naked eye. Actually, I think this is a perfect board. Let's look at the microscope. Uh, let me, uh, boop this real quick. Boop. There we go. Let's bigger. There we go. So first thing I'll check is the microcontroller to make sure there's no shorts. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell on this microscope. Uh, but I looked at my with it, my naked eye and I didn't see any shorts. Uh, yeah, it's looking pretty good so far. Uh, yeah, nothing too crazy here. Yeah, it's all looking good. I'm gonna double check with my proper microscope just to be sure. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Then I'll check the boost converter. Uh, that shifted a little bit, but I think it's okay. Yeah, it's not shorted against anything, is it? No, that'll be fine. And that boost converter's down here. Um, boost converter doesn't have any shorts, however, that middle pin right there it looks like it didn't reflow correctly. It might be fine, I'll test it with a multimeter. But it's just things like that to look out for. Uh, another thing that always gives me issues is this SD card slot. Is sometimes, since it's a little bit springy on those pads, they'll spring up a little bit and won't fully connect. Uh, we'll test that a little bit later, but uh, it's pretty hard to spot it right off the bat. Let's see. They look fine. I can see a little bit of solder next to that second pin. That might be a short, so I'll clean that out in just a bit. But uh, yeah, that's actually a really good reflow. Cool. Okay, let's go ahead and start soldering things. outside, so now it's hot in here. That lovely California everything is on fire weather. What are you using to magnify it? Um, I've had this cheap little USB webcam microscope for the longest time. I will like when I'm doing this for real, I will use my proper. Eh, it's out of the way. I'll use my proper microscope. This big bad boy, which you. <laughs> Basically, big microscope. You get the idea. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna check it real quick if you guys don't mind, just to double check. Um, I figured I would throw that little USB one on there just like so give you an idea of how I check these things, but uh. Yeah, normally I'll check it by eye first, and then I will double check with this microscope to make sure there's no shorts. And it is looking real nice, cool. I wish I had like the Lewis Rossman version of the scope that had like the camera port in it so I could show you guys directly what I'm seeing, but uh, this little USB one should <sighs> work just fine. It's actually, it's not too bad. Um, the resolution isn't the highest, and the little light isn't the best, but it, it gets the job done. Uh, let's see. So I kind of have an order of operations of how I do <clears throat> the, uh, the through-hole soldering. I will do the programming header first, because it's hard to um, 
solder when you have the USB in place, then I'll do this potentiometer for the brightness of the LCD, or the contrast. Then you can pretty much do whatever after that. I'm just searching for that specific part. There we go, there's the headers. So for through-hole parts, what I'll do is I'll, I'll put them in, I'll hold them from the other side to make sure they are stable and in place, then I'll flip it over, use a little bit of flux on a couple of the pins, not all of them, you don't have to use all of them, and then I will make sure my soldering iron has a little bit of eh, solder on it already, and then just kind of scrape it off on one of the pins. And the joint might be really ugly at first, it's fine. It's just to hold it in place. See, to like keep it level. There we go. Oop. Try. God, that camera resolution is way better than the microscope. Shouldn't be doing this way up close. I'm trying to show one specific part, but I can't get it. There we go. See how that's perfectly level? That's what you want. Then we can start soldering the other pins. And since this is flux core, usually you don't have to worry about flux that much like external flux. Uh, this Kester stuff is really, really good. This Kester 6040, I love it. Oop. Just looking for nice clean joints here. Surprisingly difficult to show off the work. There we go. And we'll go ahead and clean off all that flux in a later stage. Those are looking pretty nice and shiny. Is that fan too noisy? The uh, fan that I'm using for the solder fumes? Because if it is, I'll just tough it. Getting cancer is fine if I get two or three more subscribers. Cool. Oh, legs out. There we go. Bad. All right, cool. Now I don't have to die of smoke inhalation. Beautiful. That was the potentiometer for the LCD contrast. Coffee's starting to kick in. I can feel my hand getting all shaky. Yeah. Check my eye, make sure the USB port is level. It's very important that you make sure the USB port is sitting flush because if it's not, someone might plug something in and then rip it off, and that is bad. Same thing with the MIDI jack. There's a lot of force on this old school MIDI jack because the connector itself is chonky. People have to really push into it, so you have to make sure that is flush and soldered well, or else you're just gonna rip it out of the board. 
<laughs> Have you seen a bag of 300 headphone jacks? Yeah! <laughs> That's one fun part about doing this all yourself, is uh, just having obscene quantities of just small components. Love it. Yeah, 10 to 15 headphone jacks is pretty good. Uh -oh. uh, JLC. There's a little tiny bit of solder from the factory that's blocking this from going through. It's fine. Uh, yeah, push one of the pins. Okay, one second. We gotta expand this hole. The switches used in the night blaster. Honestly, those switches went uh, end of life, so having almost a hundred of them, pretty lucky. I don't have any of them left. I did find one alternative. I should probably go back and update the Mega Blaster. I, <laughs> the Mega Blaster itself is pretty much end of life. Dang. Okay, that's good. There we go. Uh, but yeah, I did manage to find one alternative switch for it. Oh, you never got yours to work? Well, that's a shame. Uh, did you have any sort of like, uh, like did it power on or did the YM2612 get hot or something like that? If the YM2612 doesn't get hot at all or gets like supremely hot, that means you probably have a fake YM2612. Which is sadly becoming more and more and more and more common. So many of these uh, Chinese factories are rebadging RAM chips as YM2612s. Ugh, it is so annoying. It was bad enough when they were rebadging legit chips. Like, you're not fooling anyone. This, this chip is not <laughs> from 2019. Also, this song kicks ass. I, I really don't know why they do that. Like, I don't care if the chip is scuffed up. Just give me an unmarked, legit YM2612. Doesn't matter. Unfortunately, there's a lot of heavy competition because everyone wanted to make a YM2612 synth nowadays. Which is cool, it's neat that the space is active, but it means competition for the chips is getting spicy. What's up there as your favorite chip two tracks? Well, funny enough, uh, the song that's currently playing is one of my favorites for sure. Um, one soundtrack that kicks ass is uh, the Neo Geo game uh, Neo Turf Masters. It's like a golf game, right? But it slaps. Oh my god, that soundtrack's amazing. It's on the um, YM2610. Another good one is um, Dragon Saber for the 2151, but it uses the C140 PCM chip, which is like some insane 32 channel PCM chip. Oh, super good. Your blue pill board doesn't light up. Oh, that's not good. Um, maybe check the polarity on the diode of the, uh, the DC DC converter next to the power socket. If it's backwards, then you won't get power anywhere. And also, I think the DC DC gets really hot when you do that. Yeah, 
Thunder Force. So many of these uh, 26 12 cents, they don't have the PSG, but you listen to a song like this, it's like, ah, oh, it's pivotal. You gotta have the PSG. That is definitely part of the Genesis sound. It ain't just the FM. Oh, have you not checked out Thunder Force? Oh my god, Thunder Force 4 soundtrack is like legendary. No, Thunder Force does in fact use the PSG, it uses it quite a bit, it doesn't use PCM. Like the drums are all FM, they're not PCM samples. Like if you can hear the do 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 that's the PSG. Yeah, it's insanely impressive. Like, I, 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 I'm picking up what you're laying down. Uh, it not using PCM at all is unreal. It is probably one of the most impressive soundtracks on the system. Oh, let me go grab some sockets. Y'all ever seen this many sockets? Wait, can I get this in frame? Let's see. Eh, eh, eh. There you go. Tube goes on forever. <laughs> so many. King, it plays okay on this latest version of the Mega Blaster firmware, but uh, I remember on my early prototypes, the PCM samples on this soundtrack, oh, ruined me. There's definitely a little bit of slowdown still, I can kind of hear it, but it was way, way worse on my earlier prototypes. Uh, bubble bubble. Ba dun dun dun, ba dun dun dun, ba dun dun ba dun dun. That game's cute. And shiny. Ooh, Virtual Fighter 2, that's actually not a soundtrack I've listened to. I'm gonna put that on the list. something good. Yeah! Right, let's put in the buttons. This is the part I always hate. It takes forever.
One thing you always got to do is make sure your buttons are flush and aligned because nothing's worse than soldering a through hole component, especially like a button, and having it be wonky. Then you have to cut off all the tracks and completely redo it. start randomly busting out in song with some weird 80s pop song. Then I love you, but stop it please. I saw Ben's teardown of the, uh, the Sharp 68K. God, that is a gorgeous computer on the inside. Japanese uh, industrial design. And it has a 2151 in it. Uh oh, did the Mega Blaster crash? Check it in just a second. We have crashed. We have found a little bit here. Reset. No, I haven't. Hardcore, modulars, and massive drums. Oh, I'm always down with like cool big drums. Those old, um, those old like Yamaha electric drums where you hit them, it's like the foo. I love that. Oh, we're almost done with this board, actually. Little rotary encoders. <laughs> I can only- I love these encoders. Like, they're the perfect size, they're clicky, they got a push button. I can only find them from a single seller on eBay. And I know he's importing them from, like, some Chinese seller. I cannot find these exact ones anywhere except this one eBay seller. They're like EC5s or some something like that. But I can never find this exact one. Only a single eBay seller. So if he goes under, like, ugh. No, please. I'm keeping them afloat single-handedly. Thank you, Rotary Encoder Man. No, this is a good song. Sonic 3D Blast. 
pretty slapping soundtrack in a game, but good soundtrack. Yeah, uh, Game Hut. Uh, John from uh, Traveler's Tales. I'm kind of glad he's back doing his uh, his normal thing. He got weird there for a second when he was trying to, uh, like... I, okay, let's just use the word for it. He was just, like, trying to straight-up shill his, like, classic game streaming service that was awful. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kind of glad that he's, he's done with that, because... Uh, I did not subscribe for a mediocre pitch to a service that's dead on arrival. Sorry, John. Yeah, when it comes to his programming stuff, though, like that, that's what I subscribe for. Uh, his knowledge of how to program visual effects on those old consoles, oh my god, incredible. And to think that it's all assembly, too. What was he trying to sell? He was trying to sell, like, um... Like, a game streaming service for retro games. Like, the whole idea was like, Oh, you don't have to worry about bandwidth, uh, downloading these... <laughs> these 40 kilobyte games. Instead, you have to worry about streaming video from a cloud computer. <laughs> You know, where one second is probably like <laughs> 300 kilobits per second at the very least. It's probably like a 3 megabit per second stream, which is like, in one second, you're probably bigger than the entire ROM file. The, the entire concept was flawed from the very beginning, but uh, yeah, he was trying to sell that hard. And his entire subscriber base is like, uh, we don't want this, can you please just go back to normal videos? It was, it was just weird, like, it, it took four seconds to understand that the entire concept was flawed, like, literally just run an emulator and have the ROM stored locally and your experience would be a thousand times better than trying to do, like, cloud gaming service for old games. It just made no sense. Yeah, he was going for the mass market, but I don't know, it just... First off, cloud gaming in general, it... I don't know, the, the appeal is so niche, and it's so limited, and it's so just like... The latency of the internet just ruins the experience for a lot of people. You have to have a good connection for it to be even playable, so... That, and combined with the fact that you can just run a ROM locally, way better than a streaming service. It just doesn't make sense to me. We all know how good Google Stadia did with the modern games. Imagine it with old school video games only. Yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah, it, 
Mm, I don't know. Like, honestly, the hardest part of emulation is getting the ROMs, but if you had, like, a streamlined service that would just automatically get the ROM and set it up for you on your phone or whatever, I don't think it would be that big a deal. Yeah, people, um... <clears throat> people emulating on their, on their own, uh, using, you know, less than legitimate means, Obviously, that requires a, a tiny bit of expertise, but if you had a service that just set the ROM up for you, it probably would not be that bad. In fact, that's what Nintendo does with the virtual consoles. What's that? Beautiful. Nice and shiny. You wrote a paper? <laughs> yeah. The concept to me, like, I can see what they're trying to do, but uh, the laws of physics kind of prevent it from being enjoyable because, you know, unless we got some sort of like quantum fluctuations where information travels instantly across space, uh, you still gotta deal with the latency of the internet. Not only latency, but the amount of bandwidth that it consumes. I mean, it's essentially like a high-definition video stream. Well, not essentially, it is. So if you're streaming to 4K, you are chewing through bandwidth like crazy. <clears throat> there are... I, I can't say that there's not a niche for it. That's why services like Stadia and GeForce Now and stuff exist. There are some people that want like a high fidelity gaming experience and don't really care about the latency all that much. But again, it is really niche. When you have to think about the amount of compute powder, power that you have to set up in the cloud just to run that kind of stuff, oh my god. Ridiculously expensive and they're gonna have the tiniest subscriber base. Yeah, this song slaps. I love Hydrosity Zone. Uh, it was written by the keyboardist that worked with Michael Jackson. Alright, I think that is our board right there. Uh, pin headers are installed and everything's good. Um, at this point, I will flash the firmware. Um, I'll usually flash the firmware and test the SD card because that's, on, that's a really common point of failure. Um, and then after, after it successfully reads the SD card, then I do cleaning. And then after cleaning, I will do um, the base plate. I'll screw in the base plate, the standoffs, the LCD, solder the LCD, clean it up one more time, and we should be good. Okay, so my little programmer, <laughs> my official Arduino programmer, uh, you can program any Mega MIDI at home using any Arduino, like any 8-bit Arduino, like the normal one or a Nano or a Mega or whatever, all you have to do is put a 10 microfarad cap across reset and ground, and then essentially you're just hooking up the SPI pins. And then uh, I wrote a little script that actually flashes the former automatically once it detects your uh, Arduino. It's relatively painless. I really wish I could do direct firmware updates on this chip. It is definitely possible, but um, in order to have the MIDI server running and serial control, I actually have to sacrifice DFU, so it's like, ah, it's, it's another one of those trade-offs. Yeah, Rystar, I love the soundtrack. It's so cute. <laughs> Got PSG on the mind. <laughs> Getting this framing right is really, really difficult because my camera is like above me and upside down and flipped. 
every dimension is wrong. Alright, stay there. So, uh, basically all I have to do is just select the port, so I know that this Arduino is on COM5, so I'll just put 2, and this script will automatically go out to GitHub, find the latest firmware, and then start flashing. And you can see the flashing in the Arduino. Now what we want is to see all these LEDs light up, and then show the no SD card error, and then we're going to put an SD card in, and if it doesn't show any lights, then we're good. If it does show the uh, SD card error lights, then we have to go back and resolder the SD so uh, socket connector, which is common because those springy contacts like I was talking about earlier. It's kind of a pain in the butt because then I have to wait for my soldering iron to cool down so I can get a, uh, a conical tip. I'm also aware that I could uh, set the script up to program way faster, but that requires modifying one line of code in the Arduino flashing script, and uh, we can't have our users modifying code. That's scary. All right, so we should see the LEDs, good, and then they should turn into that pattern. Can't read the SD cards, so that's what we expected. And unplug that. Now, I want to put an SD card in and then power it up again. <laughs> Here's the uh, dusty old uh, version 1 Mega MIDI. This is the very first one I built on the uh, on the version 5 SKU. Old boy, old faithful. Let's take his SD card out. Okay, here's the moment of truth. Here's where it either <clears throat> goes smoothly or we're going back and fixing things. Uh, what we want to see is all of these LEDs light up first, and then they'll turn off and stay off. If they show an L or an, a uh, SD card read error, then we have to go back and fix the socket. Let's see, moment of truth. Looking good. Cool. We did it! Most of the time it's good, but occasionally you'll get a lifted pin and it's a real pain to fix. Uh, I'm gonna check the boost voltage real quick. Um, it looks everything looks okay. But uh, I saw that pin, it looked like it wasn't completely soldered down, but if the voltages are good here, it should be fine. Uh, we're expecting about 6 point something volts here. That's relatively low. Yeah, that's not correct. Yeah, four volts out of the regulator. Okay, uh, so we got a little bit of an issue. I need to go back and fix that boost converter. I think it's got kind of a resistive ground. All par for the course. Let's see, can I fix this on the cheap crappy microscope? This is gonna be a nightmare, actually. <laughs> Because I've been through OBS. Oh god. Let's see. There we go. Yeah, see that middle pin? That's not looking too good, so we'll go ahead and fix that. Uh, this is kind of going to be a pain with my current tip. I usually use a pretty fat chisel tip, but. Eh. Can't be asked to swap it out. Oh, solder, please. 
that's underneath the uh, microscope. Sorry for shaky cam. Okay, this tip might be too big. There we go. Uh, it's a little blobby, but it should be fine. Yeah. As long as there's no shorts, we're good. Yeah, it should be good. Okay. Yeah, all these resistors are looking okay. Yeah, let's try again. Yeah, chisel tips are absolutely the way to go. Um, I will only use conical tips if I literally cannot get to it. Yeah, chisel tips are absolutely the way to go. Hot there. That's weird. Uh, the resistors might be incorrect because you know focusing on the screen. Let me just double check real quick. Uh, 12k. Oh, yep. Okay, I got that one. My bad. I swear this never happens. Goody, time for a hot air gun. It's always fun. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many things in this way. Oh my god, I don't know if I'm gonna make it this through here. Like the tripod and everything. Yeah, honestly, I just, I can't get into conical tips, like, I think they're kind of a beginner crutch tool, um, but once you have, uh, once you have tips that have a lot more heat in it, it's just, it's so much easier to work with. So, right now I'm fixing a mistake with the programming resistors on this, uh, boost converter. <laughs> I guess I was paying attention to the stream too much. Uh, I just got them backwards. Fortunately, it's a pretty easy fix. Uh, if I wasn't paying attention, I probably could have set this to a way higher voltage. Fortunately, the linear regulators would probably take care of that. But uh, it wouldn't exactly be good. There we go, all fixed. And then I'll tap those with an iron to make sure that they are uh, nice and proper. Hot air cooling down. Yes, okay. Beautiful. Okay. We should be good now. Yeah, let's go around the screen, but whatever. That's what we're looking for. Cool. So just the uh, little resistor there. At 6.5 volts. Perfecto. 
What flex do I have? Uh, this is one of my favorite flexes. Uh, it's, it's kind of a pain in the butt to get it. It is uh, Kester 959T. Uh, this is like an unofficial bottle. You can only get this flux in like gigantic jugs. So people online will sell like tiny containers of it. But uh, yeah, I love this stuff because it's so thin. Uh, if you need like a thicker like tree sap flux, there is, uh, it's not 959, it is, uh, where is my bottle of it? <laughs> This stuff, this rosin flux from MG, uh, this works great. It is literally death sauce though, so uh, you have to be in a well ventilated room for this because, uh, like, this sticker right here, if you breathe the smoke, this sticker has never been more apt. That's exactly how it feels, like your insides are just being ripped apart. <laughs> Ooh, the microcontroller is a little warmer than I want it to be. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> it's because I used the hot air gun. Uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> it feels like a face hugger in your lungs. Okay, at this point, uh, I will clean the board. So just give me a second to get the cleaning supplies, and then we shall put in the chips, make sure everything works, and then we can install the LCD. All right. No, I forgot my brush. Hold on. Safety first. Alright, let me check your Mega Midi. <clears throat> so, ah, Aiden, how do you clean the negatives? Well, I use isopropyl alcohol, 99%. And a toothbrush. It's the way to go. I also keep the SD card in the socket to make sure flux doesn't get on the contacts, which is a pretty common failure point.
So I'll do the front and back. I'll do the scrub, and then I'll just do a light pass with this towel. Like I'm not getting all the alcohol off it. Uh, I'll use compressed air to get rid of the rest. But uh, let me do the uh, back the card first. I don't need this uh, band anymore. Fancy, only the finest toothbrushes. Um, when you're dealing with through hole stuff, usually the flux is a lot thicker, like a lot more burnt on. So you just want to give the alcohol just a second to kind of get at it and you can brush it. Oh, so shiny. One thing I can't stand though is uh, no matter how much I clean, there's always like a white powdery residue. I can never get that off. I have no idea how to get rid of it. It's not really that much of an issue, but you'll see it in between like the, uh, the microcontroller pins. Ugh. It's especially annoying on black PCBs. Like, unless you have an ultrasonic cleaner, it's really hard to get rid of all flux. Even with an ultrasonic cleaner, it's hard to get rid of all flux. But uh, you'll always see sometimes like a little bit of sticky residue on these green boards, but on the black boards, oh my God, it looks like I dunked it in acid or something. I'm going to mute the mic while I blast very loud compressed air. Thank you, 
Thank you for telling me the mic is unmuted. Yeah, I was saying, uh, I actually have legit unmarked chips. Oh, look how beautiful they are. They're so hard to find. <laughs> I actually have a whole bag of legit YM2612s, but they're remarked so they look like the fake chips. I almost threw them all out. They, they work perfectly fine, but they have like the worst markings on them. Ugh. These things? Ugh. <laughs> God, they look terrible. Yeah, so... This is what a legit YM2612 looks like. And then you got this. What is that? What are those? Okay, let me flip this upside down. What are those? Now, see, they're actually, this is a real YM2612, it's just remarked, so it looks like the big RAM chips. And you can tell it's real because if you look at the package style, the ejector pin and the pin marker is actually the same. And so is the, like, the package case, and I bet this probably says Japan on the bottom. Yeah, it's, it's probably hard to see, but if you, if you look closely, you see how it says Japan? Yeah, that's a really good indicator of finding legit chips. But, <laughs> my guys... They, they weren't making these chips in 2016. <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I'll probably, I'll burn through the legit marked ones first, and then if I can't find any more, I'll go through these remarked ones, because they're still real chips, it's just, I don't know, it bugs me when they remark them. It's, it's a real pain, because they keep remarking RAM chips, and those ones will actually probably do damage to whatever system you're working on, because the pinouts are completely different. But it's always worth, like, checking it anyway, just briefly, because it might be a real chip just remarked. I don't know. It, it's just getting real tiring keeping up with these uh, scammers. Uh, okay, so before we screw the base plate and the LCD on, we need to actually test the synthesizers to make sure they work. <clears throat> so let's boot this music real quick. Sorry if anyone liked that soundtrack. Okay, moment of truth. So, up. Yeah, it's entirely possible. Um, if you short things incorrectly or like uh, you're running five volt signals on something that's expecting three volts or no no signal whatsoever you might burn out the MCU uh, you said you made a mega blaster so yeah that's a three volt system so if, uh, if you had a RAM chip that was writing five volt signals on the data bus then it's entirely possible that you killed your uh, your blue pill board Okay, test time. So I have a pretty simple testing procedure for this. Uh, I'll test it without the LCD because it's a pain in the butt to, you know, uh, get into this chip and stuff all that and fix all that when the LCD is on. Uh, let me up the volume on the input a little bit. Okay, so first thing I'll do is I'll just open up a really simple MIDI keyboard on my computer and I'll just test to make sure things work. It's sounding good, making sure both channels are coming through. All good, and then I will change to channel 2 and check the PSG. Very good. So everything is working, and the, uh, the amplifier is working correctly. Then once I have that, I will get my <clears throat> MIDI controller and I will test MIDI on the, the hardware port itself. So let me get that set up real quick. 
Hopefully my mini controller behaves. It's been kind of a pain in the butt lately. Uh, micro USB should be outlawed from every device. It is the worst connector. Breaks on everything. There we go. Then we can test the chonky USB port. Or not USB MIDI port. There we go. I'm not a keyboardist, I'm trying my best. One cool thing you can do is actually, um, if your MIDI controller has an arpeggiator, Trying to find a good position. <laughs> I hit the pitch bender. If you uh, hit the uh, LFO. You can use the modulation wheel. <laughs> I'm glad you're excited, Mitty. It, it really is just a fun little tool to mess around with. <laughs> I can always go to channel 2 for the uh, PSG. Actually, the PSG is really fun to arpeggiate. Uh, I also have a noise channel in here. What did I put the noise channel on? This is arpeggiated. That's good for uh, like sound effects and stuff. That's all the noise channels on the PSG. So I'm going to reset this and then I'll show you actually my sneaky way of testing all the buttons and stuff without actually having a display. There is um, the PSG, one kind of downside of having it on the board is it's pretty dang susceptible to digital noise. Um, you'll hear it when the LCD is up updating, there's like a little bit of a clicking noise. The LCD will never update. Once you send it a MIDI signal, the LCD stops updating so you don't have to worry about noise then. But um, whenever you click one of these buttons, it'll update the LCD and you can hear a little bit of a, a click click on the um, going through the PSG. And that's how I actually test these buttons without having the display, so if you listen closely, you'll hear a little click. And all of those buttons just work because I heard the click on all of them. And then I can test the rotary encoder in the same way. Yep, okay. It's basically as I, I, I've memorized what the actual LCD looks like on here. So I can, I can pretty much tell when everything works just by the sound it makes through the uh, digital interfe uh, interference. But um, yeah, everything is pointing to this working perfect on the first try, so which is fun. That saves me a lot of time. Um, MIDI works, USB works. Um, let's go ahead and get the base plate on. So for this one, since it's number 100, normally they'll have like a normal black base plate. 
but uh, I've done a little something special for this one. Hold on. I've used some very special shiny purple filament. This is like the uh, Poly Alchemy Silk series, and it is really, really expensive filament, but oh my god, it looks so cool. I love that look. How shiny it is. Ooh! Ooh -wee. Hell yeah. So this is gonna go on number 100. Uh, standoffs. Standoffs. Fun fact, talk about screws and standoffs. Uh, originally, and you can probably see it on like the product photos, I actually used little plastic sand standoffs and stuff, and they worked fine. Like, uh, they're totally enough. Like, this thing is not hauling trucks or whatever. It's not really supporting that much weight, so the plastic ones work fine. Uh, but the plastic standoffs would always break. Like, their, their thread would always break inside of these sockets, or it would break the actual socket off. And I would have to reprint the entire thing. Uh, so I was just like, you know what? These things are more expensive, but they look better. Like they're way more sturdy and they never break. They always thread correctly. So yeah, that's why these are brass standoffs instead of the black ones. I also did the same thing with the screws, but uh, I actually just recently found some of these blacked out screws so I can get the original kind of blacked out look I was looking for. Fancy. That's the kind of thing us engineers think about. Lots of screws. Sitting on McMaster car going, oh yeah, I dig that. Always handy to have a hex driver for these things. It makes it super easy. Just take fastener, put it in the hex driver, ta-da, and you can screw it in like normal. Is it 3D printed? Yes, it is. I wish I could injection mold these things, but I don't have a spare two hundred thousand dollars. Make sure to do your star pattern correctly so you don't have part of the board sticking out. Oh, this purple base plate looks way cooler than I thought I was going to. Oh, that's awesome. God, I should just kind of keep it on there. I <laughs> I should get like an Osh Park board because they do purple PCBs. That's what I should have done. Oh, that looks so cool. I dig it. What printer? I use a Prusa uh, i3 Mark III. Mark III S, actually. The earlier versions used my old CR10, and I used masking tape. <laughs> so the pattern on the bottom always looked terrible. Um... For most of these Mega Midis, I've been using the Prusa's uh, like textured springboard, uh, but it didn't really look that good with this particular f filament. So if you're getting a normal Mega Midi, you'll just have a black base plate and I'll have that kind of texture on it. But for this one, I did smooth because it's you know it's supposed to be shiny. Uh, when I first started doing these things, I was thinking I could have people choose their color of base plate, which would be really cool, don't get me wrong. Uh, but then uh, I realized that these base plates take three hours each to print, and it, the, the assembly of the Mega Midi relies on having the base plate complete. So uh, it, it would I could never have any stock because it would just take way too long, and you'd have to wait for people to actually you know, choose the base plate so I can do the final assembly. So I'm like, you know, I just have to pick one. So I just chose black because usually people don't have an issue with black on products. Conditions are appreciated. I'd love to buy one. Yeah, definitely don't go with Ultimakers. Those were just kind of like the original 3D printer brand, uh, but they are definitely overpriced and they underperform. Um, the Prusa, honestly, is kind of like the same idea as this Mega Midi. It's like an, it's an open source kind of hardware hacky kind of thing, and since so many people have it, 
Uh, it, it's really, really well supported. Um, is it the best 3D printer for the money? I don't think so, but since it's so well supported and so open source, if you have any sort of problem, it's really easy to find solutions for it or print parts for it. And there's a whole bunch of third party support and all that stuff. If you're looking for the best bang for your buck, honestly, the Ender 3, the Ender 3, or the Prusa Mini that's coming out. I think that's still kind of expensive, but it's got some good features for the price. Um, the only thing I wish that the Prusa I have had was 32 bit support, but honestly, that's like, who really cares? It'll, it'll get the job done just like any other printer. Uh, but the 8 bit hardware is definitely kind of showing its age nowadays. Uh, Ender, like E N D E R, Ender, like Ender Dragon from Minecraft. <laughs> Ender 3 is probably one of the best bang for the bucks. I think they mostly use Prusa's designs anyway, so it's all pretty similar. Nowadays, you it's it's pretty hard to go wrong with a 3D printer. Most brands are pretty reputable. Um, the only brand that I would stay away from is Anet, because uh, they go a little too cheap, and they've had a history of just kind of skirting security regulations, and some people have caught their house on fire because of them. <laughs> Usually, Creality is the... Fairly legit though. Alright, let me go grab an LCD dot and right back. buy in bulk these LCDs while they are good. There's a couple <clears throat> logistical issues with them. Uh, I love these LCDs. They work just fine. Um, they almost always have that stupid I squared C backpack on them and it's really hard to find sellers that don't add that stupid backpack. Like I just want the bare board itself because I, I hook it up just directly to the parallel line, right? So there's that problem. And uh, domestically, they're really expensive. These are like seven or eight dollars domestically, uh, but you can import them. It's like uh, four dollars each, so like you buy ten of them for about forty bucks, and that's that's fairly reasonable. But you have to one, there's a humongous lead time, so you never know where you're gonna get these, especially with the USPS being completely broken nowadays. And uh, sometimes the Chinese sellers will just toss these into like a jiffy bag, like completely loose and they'll scratch up against each other and be all damaged and stuff because these are these are fairly chunky units and they have a really soft display right here so it's really easy to damage these so uh, it's just these are a pain in the butt to keep stock of <laughs> one thing i would like to change about this is i i, I dig this design actually like getting this lcd lined up so it's kind of like its own enclosure i dig that design the only problem is um the, the data bus is, is soldered in, right? So if you want to remove this LCD, you have to desolder all of these, which is kind of a pain. Uh, I really wish I could come up with a way to make this like a connector instead, so you could just take the LCD off. But um, uh, there's like structural reasons behind that because once this is all screwed down and soldered in, it's actually really rigid. So while I like it when everything works, if you're the kind of person that's inclined to hack the hardware, Taking this off is kind of a pain. That's the only thing I've really changed, to be honest. Uh, screws, we need four of them. <laughs> it's cool that you learned about it. Yeah, I can't wait for that unit to get to you. Um, yeah, last I checked, it's in Chicago International, which is a really good sign that it's actually going to start going where it's supposed to. Uh, hopefully it doesn't end up in Idaho or whatever. <laughs> really spiffy if our postal service would uh, start working again. RP. I'm Google that right now. Harpy. I'm getting Harpy. There we go. 64 pixies, is that it? 
Oh yeah, look at that little arpeggiator unit. That's cute. I like it. Yeah, where they have the little stacked boards on top of each other. I like that design. Um, especially since it's so rigid. Like it, it this thing kind of feels like a, a small tank when it's all put together because everything is supporting itself. Yeah, this stack design, especially with the brass standoffs. Oh, you sell these. Oh, how cool. Yeah, I'm looking at the page right now. A mini arpeggiator. Ooh, you're going with the kit. Going with the kit is admirable, because then you have to deal with people's um, support questions when they mess it up. <laughs> Yeah, I put a 5 volt in ground backwards and it exploded. Do you have any advice? <laughs> the bottom right picture. I'm looking at the Tindy page right now. Oh, I see. You have it on your own website, too. Here, let me load that up. Oh, I see. Oh, that's an interesting design. I like that. That kind of boxy shape. It's all held together. That's cool. Wow, you got this for sale like everywhere. Holy, holy. <laughs> this is really cute. I love it. Oh, wow, you have like three boards stacked up, don't you? Damn, that's really cool looking. Yeah, I dig that design. Um, I see how you're using like connectors and stuff so you can like easily take things apart. Yeah, if I had to redo this design, I would probably specify a connector of some sort so it's easier to take the display apart. Um, for the most part, you don't really need to bother what's happening with these chips down here. It's pretty much all self-sufficient, but uh, I don't know, if you ever wanted to modify the hardware to work with like a 3438 sometime in the future, <laughs> then you'd definitely have to take the LCD off. Oh, I see, so you're selling your friends to that? Oh, that's pretty cool, actually. <laughs> I've, I've offered to construct um, my friend Natalie's uh, Mega Girl units, but... Uh, God, it's, it's kind of a pain in the butt because she uses a lot of really nice parts. Don't get me wrong, the parts are nice, but uh, they're, they're kind of specialty parts that are expensive and hard to keep in stock. And the boards themselves take forever to make because they're all through hole. So it's just like finding a balance between paying her for all the work she's done, which is ridiculously like a huge amount of work, and then paying myself for the labor. And uh, yeah. I don't know, business and friendships are always kind of tricky. Because you want to be fair, but at the same time, you gotta, you gotta pay yourself. And I generally kind of steer away from selling other people's work. Something about that, even if it's an open source project, I don't know, I just... Uh, it doesn't feel right, it feels like I'm leeching. Not to imply that you are, I'm sure you're, you've got it all figured out, but... That's just... Way... I feel about selling other people's stuff. I think they should always sell it. Are all the parts through hole? No, most of them are SMD. Uh, the through hole parts are usually the connectors and the pin headers and the actual sound chips themselves are through hole. This is the last thing I need to solder. This is the LCD. 
And then after this, I just do one little cleanup, put the serial number stickers and stuff on, and then it's good to go. Uh, this particular unit, there is one more in stock. It's like number 98 or something like that. Uh, I had one of my friends buy number 99. But um, I'll send this one first to the first person that buys it. Like if you put an order in now or whatever, I'll just send this 100 one out. And then I'll put 98 in the queue for the next person. Yeah, it is tricky sometimes when you're not used to SMD stuff. But since this is numero, uh, what's 100 for Spanish? <laughs> 100. <laughs> uh, I think I've gotten a little bit used to it by now. It's just practice. Practice makes perfect. Get the flux on that. Get off of there. users. Okay, well, uh, time for the final test, and then, uh, yeah, that is number 100. Holy, holy moly. Didn't expect to ever sell 100 of these things. Like I said, I technically haven't sold 100, just made 100. Almost sold 100. We're getting there. It is very humbling, to say the least. I very much appreciate the support. I'm glad people get stuff out of it. Okay, let me change the contrast on the LCD. Hey, there we go. Beautiful. That's a finished unit. Whew. How long will that take us? Two hours and 55 minutes? About three hours. That's actually somewhat on par. It's a little bit slower if I was not doing this stream thing, but that's more or less long, about how long it takes to make one. Normally I'll make two at a time, but uh, just for this one, it's special. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yep, and I can't wait for you to get it because it's so much fun. Ah, oh, this purple backplate, I love it. It looks so good. I want to pair it up with the purple PCB. Here's the next 100. Oh, geez, I sure hope so. I don't even know if there's 100 YM2612 left in the world. I'll actually take that back. There's like a couple million Genesis -s 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 Mega Drives. There's a lot of them out there to be recycled still. Not that I, that you should destroy a Genesis to get this, but those chips gotta go from somewhere. Every time I use one of these chips, I always wonder, like, what was this doing in a past life? What kind of, what, what console did this thing live in? Okay, um, the last thing I normally do is I will put a serial number on these and then I'll package them up in anti-static, mark their number, and then I put stock up. <laughs> and that's it. Eh. Let me go grab my label maker real quick. bunch of the fancy labels that you'll see on the back. Oh, I forgot. Static bag. <clears throat> Make sure to get the manual. I put a lot of work into it. It tells you how it do. Okay. Up. Then I'm going to turn off. No, I'm actually going to plug the Music player back in. Oop, that's probably loud. 
<laughs> Sorry, headphone users. I forgot I still had the levels set for the, uh... uh let's see. I still have the levels set for the, um, the MIDI players. There we go. I made the order, hopefully I'll get 100. Ah, oh, thank you, yeah, I'll... I think, uh... I think you're gonna be the winner on this one. Okay, uh, I need a label. And I'm gonna go to my database real quick to make sure this is all tracked. Oh, I'm so happy. Number 100's going in. I never thought I'd see the day. Alright. So then you get a serial number. Here's how to decode the serial numbers. It goes MM5 for Model 5, Megabitty 5. And then if you have a B, that means you have a YM2612. If you have a C, that means you have a 3438. So we're gonna go B for this one, because it's 2612. And then you get the date code, so it's 9-19-2020. And then you get the number. Oh, normally I'm used to putting two zeros, because there's actually four numbers, so like 0099. Now I get to put 0100, baby. Looking good. Ah, oh, I'm 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 so used to putting the two zeros. serial number goes on the back, but feel free to remove it if you want that shininess. These aren't paper labels, so they'll remove easily if you want. Mostly just for your reference. Oh. Look at it, lads. One hundo. Oh. Amazing. I gotta take a screenshot of this or something. My phone is currently occupied acting as the uh, webcam. Ah, number 100. Let's see. Uh, there's no way I can pause this. Hmm. <laughs> Print screen, there we go. OBS will be my screenshot. it in. Oh, it's getting so soaked right now. <laughs> that was awful. I'll never say that again. I should get a label machine, like a proper label maker, instead of like cutting all these out. But uh, have you seen how expensive label machines are? Like, bro, I'm not paying $300 for a tiny printer. Sticker paper is good enough for me. Oh, pro tip on sticker paper. 
Always keep an edge that has that little lip on it, or else you're going to be fighting with the corner for about 8 million years trying to get it to come off. Dymo label makers. Not a bad idea. At least for shipping labels it would be handy. Beauty. Should also get one of those like vacuum seal machines. Oh, they get you on the sticker paper? Boo. Well, fortunately at this low scale, I can uh, remain relatively indie and crafty. My use of tape and a folded over anti-static bag with a bit of Sharpie to indicate the number. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's, a, it's aesthetic. It's beautiful. It's art. It's indie. <laughs> Okie dokie. And usually the last detail is I will use a red Sharpie or a blue Sharpie to mark if you have a YM2612 or not. So this is YM2612. Oh, 100. Hell yeah. Thank you. Whew. That's it. That's the board. Oh. That's what goes into making one of these things. Well, thank you very much for everyone that stuck around and watched. If you have any questions about, I don't know, just any of this stuff in general, I can answer them for a couple minutes. But other than that, uh, that's all it takes. Whew. Off it goes to Idaho, <laughs> yeah. That was actually a relatively pain-free board too. Like occasionally I'll get a short and I have to like beep it out or something. Or the SD card, like I said, won't be seated correctly. That one was pretty much a straight shot. Yeah, honestly, um, it's not that bad to build these things. Usually it'll take, yeah, like two, three hours and I'll build two at a time. Um, but um, yeah. I've never really felt the need to do uh, SMD work because my volume's low enough to uh, just make them by hand. Thanks everyone. Yeah, no problem. I thought it would be interesting to show how I actually make these things. Every single one is just made right here on my bench. Here, hold on. Let's let's see if I can show you the uh, the aftermath of what it looks like on my floor. Uh, Cause like like I said, I'll, I'll take a part out of a bin and then throw it on the floor to like mark that it's done. <laughs> let's see. Uh, let me get OBS. So my floor currently looks like <laughs> just a big pile of parts. Actually, can I zoom in or out? <laughs> but uh made three hours fly by well I'm glad you enjoyed the stream I was a little bit nervous that no one would watch it and I'd spend three hours in silence like I made bored Okay, well, it's cleanup time, and I'll go check to see orders and such. And then after that, I think I earned the rest of the weekend off. So yeah, I'm glad you guys enjoyed the stream. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you so much for 100 boards. I can't believe it. Feels like when a person gets, like, 
<laughs> the first hundred subscribers or something. <laughs> All right, everyone. Bye bye.